everyone, and welcome back to a new episode of the TFDI podcast, which is brought to you by the Trade Finance Distribution Initiative. Today, we receive Adam Clark, underwriter at Liberty Specialty Markets, an insurance firm offering financial risk solutions for banks, including in the trade finance space. Um, he's here to tell us what digitization in the trade finance distribution space can bring to a company like Liberty and to the sector as a whole. So welcome, Adam, and thank you for being here. Hi, Melody. Thanks for having me. So let's start with Liberty's journey. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, what it's been like for you to cover trade finance assets when you started doing it and how this part of the business has evolved? Yeah, of course. So, um, so Liberty has been writing credit and political risks now for over 25 years. And, and before the financial crisis in 2008, a lot of what we did and what our market saw and underwrote was supporting traders and banks in their short-term trade finance business. So it's always been something that's been a part of our portfolio. But in 2018, we took a slightly more strategic approach to writing this business. Um, I was hired to focus on developing our presence in the short-term trade finance space. Um, you know, since then, in the last four years, we've been steadily building up the portfolio. Um, we have seen some of a snowball effect uh, as our appetite has been able to grow as we use the data and experience we've collected over that time. Um, and, you know, 2021 has been a real growth year for us. And we're, we're really hoping that going into 2022, we can look at other innovative ways to distribute and grow our capacity for, for new and existing clients. That's great. So have you encountered any challenges in this business so far? And if so, which ones? Yeah, th th there's definitely been a few. I mean, we certainly see see our, our strategy as, as being a success story um you know but it's not been without its challenges it, it never is unfortunately but um yeah our, our biggest internal hurdles that we faced uh, was probably adapting our underwriting appetite that we use on the wider business that we see to, to better suit the needs of, of clients in the short-term trade finance space so one of the main reasons we started doing this strategy was the, the strong performance of the underlying instruments that we would be insuring in this space um, and what we needed to do is whilst we still use the or analyze the credit risk of a, of a certain issuing bank as, as being the most important thing to us when looking at it we've also had to use the historic performance of the underlying instruments to help us get comfortable with with a lot of counterparties that we otherwise wouldn't be doing um so as underwriters we use data in in our decision making every day it's probably the most important thing for us and and whilst we had a lot of external data that was really helpful to help us drive this appetite we still needed to collect a certain amount of internal data to probably prove it to ourselves and I think that's reflected over the years as we've sort of steadily increased our appetite and expanded what we do. Um, but yeah, that was probably our biggest internal challenge. Uh, equally linked to that, we we did have to get comfortable as well with the speed at which short-term trade finance businesses transacted. I mean, we'd normally have weeks and months between receiving a, a submission and actually buying a piece of business, whereas in short-term trade finance, mm -hmm. this is often in minutes and hours. So it's a real stark difference. And where we'd normally have the time to analyze a piece of business at a transactional level, short-term trade finance just doesn't really feed itself into that. Um, you know, the good news is though that because the underlying instruments are all very similar and it's fairly homogenous compared to what we'd see elsewhere, what we have had to do is sort of step back from doing it at a transactional level and look at it at a counterparty level. So what we'd actually do is we would um, consider our appetite for a given issuing bank, we can set a counterparty limit and then agree on certain parameters that we're comfortable with, such as maximum tenors, maximum transactional limits and minimum pricing. And then providing a submission can fit within that criteria, we can turn around a quote in the hopefully minutes and hours that our, our clients need. Um, and then probably the, the last hurdle and probably the most important one at the moment is the administrative burden that we're facing at the moment so you know it's a great problem to have we're, we're doing a lot of business but having done over 200 transactions to date this year the processing function itself is becoming increasingly burdensome and what that's really doing is driving home the need for more digitization to help us manage that process yeah, great transition to, to our next yeah. question. <laughs> so I guess, uh, yeah, the issues that you mentioned, data, uh, speed, uh, and the administrative burden are all things that can be um, tackled with digitization. So tell me a little bit how you expect digitization and automation to assist you in this part of the business. Yeah, probably in, in all those things you just said there. So I mean, um, 
digitalization and automation are are imperative to to the long-term success and the growth of our short-term trade finance business uh, and yeah there's a few ways in which it can obviously benefit us and, and everyone else involved so as i mentioned the the speed at which business needs to be done in the short-term trade finance world is is you know of the utmost important really and, and whilst i said we've taken that step back to change our underwriting approach um what we can do with digitization is we could take those pre-agreed underwriting limiters and parameters put them onto an online platform and then if a electronic submission was to be received through that uh, digital platform our brokers and clients can get a response in in literally seconds and you know that's that will be brilliant and you know we're going to see other benefits from that as well such as easier limit management so we can track all of our quoted bound and expiring business in in, in one place and that will allow us to really drive the utilization of our capacities as much as possible um, as well as the transacting side of the business as i said the biggest burden for us at the moment is, is the administrative process and you know our end goal here is obviously full api integration so you know our systems and those of our clients brokers and distribution partners all link up and can seamlessly transfer data between one another um obviously we're not there yet um but in the meantime there's still loads of efficiencies we can have in just sort of downloading data from one system and putting onto another without the need for that full integration and by removing that requirement to manually enter the data from from hundreds of policies we can spend a lot more time in developing relationships with our clients or with new clients and also growing our appetite in the space um other benefits as well and one i'm, I'm particularly keen on and a bugbear of mine is is data standardization and data validation so generally speaking with digitization we're we're going to get a lot of help with internal um data standardization and, and that basically helps us link our internal data with that of our external data sources as well and, and by doing so we can build a much richer underwriting environment for us to work with, within and, and as a data-driven underwriter as i said that is that is absolutely important to us um and, and yeah other than that it's 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 sort of endless really what what we can do with digitalization we're sort of here of platforms that can help with kyc and due diligence processes and you know the more we can automate the tasks that don't necessarily need a, a hands-on approach for every single time the, the better i think yeah yeah definitely and do you foresee any technical or potentially cultural obstacles to the large-scale digitization of trade finance distribution uh yes unfortunately unfortunately i do um i mean i i don't think we're going to see a quick transition to a fully digitized marketplace as there's definitely some technical issues blocking the way and possibly slightly more concerning some cultural ones as well um, so speaking of my experience in the insurance market digital advancement does tend to be quite slow especially when you sort of compare it to some of the other business sectors out there in the world um, it's definitely becoming more of a focus for many in the market i mean we see it as a key part of our business strategy now um, for all business lines uh, but i do think it's probably going to be some time that it becomes a sort of a crucial or, or central part of everyone's business plans and then with regards to the technical obstacles as i said system integration is is the end goal we all want to get to and it's all well and good but banks and insurers in this space they're all going to need to invest a significant amount of resource in making sure that their current systems are, are up to scratch to basically allow for that integration and the reason for this is you know technical advancements are just so quick and what some people will find is that a lot of legacy systems that they have just don't have the capabilities to have that integration that they need with other systems and platforms in the market and that's obviously going to be a problem i mean at liberty we've invested significant resources in, in updating our internal underwriting systems to make sure we're ready for that integration and i'm sure many other people in the market will be doing the same as unfortunately there's not really a an alternative solution to this you can't just magically make your platform work if it, if it doesn't so um yeah we're going to see a lot of that but again it's it's whether the speed at which the market needs it to to get there is, is going to be adequate yeah yeah so so we've talked about the benefits of, of digitization and automation for for you at liberty but i'd like to take a step back and also talk about the benefits for the industry at large so mm -hmm. how do you see these benefits, the benefits of centralizing and digitizing this activity for originators, investors, but also for the underlying trade activities? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, everyone is going to benefit from large scale distribution and automation um, in the trade finance distribution space. Um, one interesting point you picked up on there is, is centralization. I think what we will see is 
is the need for a degree of centralization in terms of the number of platforms that are available. So, you know, if all these different participants and grantors are all operating on different systems and they necessarily can't communicate with one another or communicate with another one another effectively, what we might actually find is digitalization could have a negative impact on the market in terms of efficiency and productivity. And, you know, whilst we're, we're never going to get a one size fits all approach, there's not going to be one system that does everything. Um, we are going to see different platforms specializing in certain products and services. But in order for a short term trade finance platform to succeed, I think we we would need to see a critical mass of, of banks and funds that are originating business and then also banks, insurers and other investors who want to participate in that business. But providing we can reach that stage, you know, there will be a number of benefits, as I said, for the originating banks and funds, they're going to be able to get immediate responses on new submissions from a wide range of participating banks and insurers which they otherwise not have been able to see and for participants as well um, on these platforms they can effectively distribute their capacity uh, allowing them to manage business at a more portfolio level rather than a transactional level um, and on top of that of course everyone benefits from a more connected marketplace um, originators as I said have greater access to participation partners that they otherwise wouldn't have had and equally participating uh, banks and insurers have a greater access to a much wider pool of risks that they would be interested in covering and providing we can get that right it should hopefully allow and even encourage originators to distribute more risk and bring more capital into the short-term trade finance market and in doing so you know, fingers crossed we can go somewhere to plug in that often cited uh, trade finance gap which at the moment is supposedly 1.7 trillion dollars so yeah be nice mm -hmm. if we could cover it all but uh yeah every little helps i think on that <laughs> yeah the ultimate goal <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, great. So we're reaching the end of this podcast and I'd like to, to finish on a more personal note. Um, so can you tell us what has been your latest inspiration, not necessarily related to trade finance, but it can be? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, probably sounds a bit corny and yeah, toe in the line with somewhat, but um, yeah, I do actually find this sort of the move we're seeing now um, towards sort of ESG type lending quite inspiring I mean I, I myself have a young family so I'm very interested in, in making sure that our planet is sort of fit to live in for future generations and um, yeah I think it'll be interesting to see what effect this has on on the short-term trade finance space but on our wider piece um, of business we are already seeing a lot of banks move towards more ESG linked projects and in fact a lot of clients are actually building in ESG type um, uh, factors into their pricing um, which I think is brilliant because you know i think a lot of us can question how effective various world governments might be in tackling climate change but it's sort of i think quite good to see that our sort of global banking partners are, are doing quite a bit to work towards a more sustainable future which is, as i said quite expiring i think yeah and that has evolved really quickly in recent years as well right the pace of Absolutely, change is, yeah. is inspiring yeah, yeah. Great. Well, listen, Adam, thank you so much for all your insights. And uh, yeah, we're, we're very happy to have had you here on the podcast. Uh, I'll, take you, I'll take this time to thank our listeners as well and invite you to leave any questions or comments in our comments section. Thank you very much. Thank you.